Hey guys, this is Carl Leturz, and we're over here at the Mount Juliet Library, and we're going to start a lesson called Stars and Galaxies. Now, you may have seen this lesson earlier when we first started doing these lessons, but it was a very long lesson, about 40, 45 minutes long. So what we're doing is we're taking those long lessons and we're redoing them, and we're doing them in little bite-sized pieces so that it's easier to understand. Now, what we've got over there is a beautiful constellation of stars that we call the Pleiades. By definition, a star is going to be any object in space where the gases are gravitationally held together, and as a result of this gravitational attraction, fusion happens, which is going to result in tremendous amounts of electromagnetic energy being generated and then radiated into, light, uh, into space. Next up is what we call the Small Magellanic Cloud, which is a galaxy. A galaxy is a system where everything is gravitationally bound. Stars, planets, interstellar nebula, dark matter. We know that if we take billions and billions of stars that are gravitationally held together, that's going to create a galaxy. And as we saw last week, we also realized that in all likelihood, each and every one of these stars probably has between half a dozen and a dozen planets that are orbiting around it. We put all this stuff together and we have a universe. That's the universe that you're looking at over there, guys, through the Hubble Space Telescope. You're not looking at stars. You're looking at galaxies. Each and every one of these galaxies having billions and billions of stars in it. Each and every one of these stars having billions and billions of planets that are orbiting around it. Bottom line is, big. Universe, very, very big. That's why I want you to take away from that. Now let's take a look at our galaxy. It's called the Milky Way Galaxy. As far as galaxies go, it's not very big, not very small. From one end of the galaxy to the other, it's about, give or take, 130,000 light years across. We're about two-thirds of the way out, out in the boondocks. In the center of our galaxy, just like we believe is true in the center of each and every galaxy, we believe that there is a black hole. Now to understand everything, let's take a look at a relatively easy constellation to find in the night sky. You could do that tonight, and it's called Orion the Hunter. How do you find Orion the Hunter? Look up in the sky, one, two, three, bam. Three stars, one right next to each other, right next to the other. That's what we call the belt of Orion. Now from the belt, go up in each direction, Betelgeuse and Betelgeux, fancy words for right armpit, left armpit, okay? Notice that Betelgeuse is one that we have the arrow to. That orange arrow is pointing to that orange star that we call Betelgeuse. Go back to the belt, now go down. Rigel and safe. Rigel is the one with the blue arrow that's going to be important right now. When you take a look at this, these stars tonight, take a good look at Betelgeuse. Because in all likelihood, that star Betelgeuse is not there. What? What do you mean it's not? If I'm seeing it, how can it not be there? Well, to explain that, I need to explain something called a light year. A light year is not a measurement of time. It is a measurement of distance. It is the distance that a beam of light travels in one year, trucking along at about 186,000 miles per second. Watch. Bam. In that second, that beam of light could have gone around planet Earth eight times, okay? So the speed of light, you take 186,000 per second, multiply it by 60, that's a minute, by 60, that's an hour, 24, ba bump, ba bump, big number. A light year is about, give or take, six trillion miles. That light that we're seeing over there for Betelgeuse, that light took 643 years for that beam of light traveling at the speed of light to actually be seen by planet Earth. Now the other thing I want you to understand is that stars go through phases of their life just the same as people do. When you see a star like Betelgeuse, which is red or orange, that means that that is an old star. That star is getting ready to die. When stars die, they go into something that we call a supernova, which is a massive explosion, then it collapses in upon itself. Rigel over there is a young star. It's bluish white. 
Now let's put it all together. I told you that Betelgeuse is 643 light years away. Because of its age, it probably went supernova, we'll say 200 years ago. But because it takes 643 years for that light to reach planet Earth, if it blew up 200 years ago, we're not going to know that for another 443 years. Think of this, when you look at the night sky, guys, you are looking in a time tunnel. Because each and every star, whatever else you're able to see, that stuff over there is the way it looked years ago hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, depending upon the distance away from planet Earth. I mean, really, how cool is that to be able to look back in time? Now with things like the Hubble Space Telescope, we could see things that are billions of light years away, or we're seeing things the way they look billions of years ago. Man, that's cool. Let's meet our next door neighbors. That's the Large Magellanic Cloud, about six, uh, 163,000 light years away. The Small Magellanic Cloud is just shy of 200,000 light years away. They are what we call satellite galaxies. The Milky Way galaxy is the primary galaxy, and satellite galaxies are smaller galaxies that are gravitationally held together by the larger galaxy. And what happens is they are both moving away from a central point somewhere in the universe that everything is going to be orbiting around. Now that's going to be large distances. When we're just talking about smaller distances, we use a different term called an AU, which is an astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is going to be the distance between the Earth and the Sun. 93 million miles. Now let's take a look at Jupiter. Jupiter is about 5 AUs away from the Sun or about 5 times the distance away from the Sun than planet Earth is. Now we could say 5 AUs or we could simply say 465 million miles away. Rather than using this ridiculously large number, 5 AUs is so much easier. Take Neptune. Neptune is 30 AUs away, meaning 30 times further away from the Sun than planet Earth is. Rather than saying 30 AUs, we could say 2,790,000,000. You tell me what's easier, 2,790,000,000 or just simply 30. That's the idea of, a <coughs> of an astronomical unit. Excuse me. Ooh, that's good stuff. All right. I also chose Jupiter and Neptune for a particular reason. Jupiter and Neptune are the only two planets that we know of that have what we call great spots. In the southern hemisphere of Jupiter, we see that there is the great red spot. Right around the equator around Neptune is the great blue spot. You know what those things mean? I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to wait till we do a lesson just on the planets themselves. Let's finish up on galaxies. Galaxies are named based upon their particular shape. The Milky Way galaxy is what we call a barred spiral galaxy, meaning that there's a cluster of stars right around the center of it that go across like a bar. There are likely millions and millions of those stars clustered around, and then the rest of the galaxy just orbits around like arms just swinging freely and spiraling. That's a barred spiral. A spiral is just simply the same thing, it's just spirals around without the bar. Now, an elliptical galaxy. If we take something that has, that is in the shape of a circle, and if we stretch it out, what's going to happen is it's still going to be circular, but it's not going to be a perfect circle anymore. Instead of it being a circle, it's going to be what we call oval or an ellipse. When a galaxy has an elliptical shape, we call that an elliptical galaxy. <clears throat> a lenticular galaxy is going to be a galaxy that has a dark disk going across it. That dark disk could be all sorts of different things. The Sombrero galaxy is a really good example of that. Then some galaxies have no rhyme or reason to them at all. We call them irregular galaxies. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the last one is the coolest. We call that a peculiar galaxy. A peculiar galaxy is when you've got this galaxy over here and this galaxy over here, and they get gravitationally attracted towards each other. 
Now, as they move close to each other, one of two things can happen. <clears throat> one, because of the great distances between the stars, they could pass through each other, and you would never know that anything happened on that. Or what they could do is they could collide with each other, and you have massive cataclysmic explosions happening as a result of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Either one of those things could happen. Either one of those things are incredibly cool. So let's try and summarize the whole thing, okay? Wait, Mr. Turza, do you mean to tell me that galaxies can collide with each other? With each other? Yep. Do you mean to tell me that they could just pass right through each other? Yep. Each galaxy has a black hole in the center of it? Yeah, I believe that's true. When we take a look in the galaxy, <clears throat> what we're doing is we're seeing the way things used to look like it's a time, uh, time tunnel? Yep, that's true too. Ms. Latoria, please, you're hurting my brain. Stop! But let's consider this. We've just started to scratch the surface when we're talking about astronomy. <coughs> Excuse me. There are so many cool things that we're going to be talking about when we do astronomy. One last thought, take a look at this link. You think that all science has to be boring? Nah. You want to learn about stars in a fun way? Click on that link and you're going to enjoy it. Come on, man. Learning can't be fun. Sure it can. And that's why we do this stuff over here. Take care, guys. Hope to see you soon. Bye now. Yay!